Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia, hallelujah. Good morning and welcome to this Easter Sunday service of worship of Metropolitan United Church. Good morning to you here in the church building. Good morning to you worshiping with us at home. My name is Reverend Jason Myers and I'm joined this morning by our Minister for Music, Dr. Patricia Wright, our Wayne C. Vance organ scholar, Joshua Duncan Lee, and members of the Metropolitan Choir, of course. The Metropolitan Silver Band is here, led by uh, Fran Harvey, and our Carolyn Er, who is playing outside, is Roy Lee. Reverend Mark is fulfilling a promise he made many months ago to preach this morning at his former congregation, Islington United Church, so I'm also very pleased to welcome Reverend Warren McDougall as our presiding minister today. Warren and I were having a chat a few weeks ago and he said, if you ever need help on a Sunday morning, just let me know. When before he finished his sentence, I said, how about Easter? And he said, okay. So thank you, Warren, for being here and offering your leadership with us today. I'm also thrilled to let you know that for the first time in over two years, we'll be taking communion together in a Sunday worship service. We will review this again at the time, but for the time of distribution, you'll be invited up. We will give you a piece of bread, not the cup, uh, just a piece of bread, and we'll indicate for you to come to the side, lift up your mask, take the bread, and move back to your seat. And you should know that being an affirming church, the values inclusivity, we offer an open table here at Met. All who approach the table of Christ with an open heart, willing to be served and to serve the world will be offered communion with gladness. It is Easter Sunday. Let us now proclaim the mystery of the resurrection. Please rise as you are able for our intonation for Easter, followed by our processional hymn.
please join me in the invitation to worship. The words are printed in your order of service and on your screen. We gather today to shout Alleluia. Out of the doom of death and despair, we shall live, witness, and recount the deeds. We gather today to shout Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. God of renewed presence, on this Easter day, we know that with you all things are possible. May the good news of Easter joy fill our lives and make our hearts glad. We thought we had heard it all, God, we thought we knew. The Bible stories, the words of our faith, the rules for living and the way to heaven. We thought we knew, oh God, we thought we knew. But here, before the mystery of a grave that is empty, when it should have been filled with a decaying corpse, we know now that we know nothing at all. Lord, have mercy. We thought we had heard it all, God, we thought we knew. The great stories of the church, the ebb and flow of faith, our place in the scheme of things. We thought we knew, O oh God, we thought we knew. But here before the mystery of death defeated, of broken folk made whole, and mighty powers quite broken, we know now that we know nothing at all. Lord, have mercy. We thought we had heard it all, God, we thought we knew. The way of the world, the powers that be and the powers that would be, the ebb and flow of armies and international finance, the endless tide of refugees and the obscenity of hate. We thought we knew, O oh God, we thought we knew. But here before the mystery of a word of love in a quiet garden, and the promise of a new order of creation in place of the old, tired, familiar scene, we know now that we know nothing at all. Lord, have mercy. And now let us continue to pray in silence. In any person, 
and in all circumstances, God works with wondrous power, forgiving us, renewing and restoring us, reconciling us to one another and to God. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our first reading this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in its salvation. Our New Testament lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 19 through 26. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all died in Adam, so all we will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Joyful is the tart of 
Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been laid on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been laying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the witness of the good news of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God.
This is my first ever Easter sermon. I definitely hope it is the first of many I will preach from this pulpit as we journey together as a community in the years ahead. But as with most things in life, the first of something takes on a special significance and a pressure, pressure to do it well, to get it right. This is our biggest service of the year. This is, I think, the most people we've had in the building for a service in this COVID era. This is when our live stream views spike. This is when people we haven't seen in a while come back, when people invite their friends and family members, when new people come to our church to check it out. And there is a sense and a pressure that if we get this service right, if we get resurrection right, this is how it can be all the time. And the offering plates will fill and the committees and programs will grow and the children will come back. On this Sunday, there is a pressure to equate resurrection with the glory days of Christendom, the days for which this building and our modern institution and even our contemporary concepts of the Christian community were conceived. There is a pressure to equate the resurrection we proclaim on this day with a faith of prosperity, where in our churches and in our lives there is no struggle or suffering or even death. It's all empty tombs and daffodils and full-throated hallelujahs. There is a pressure to manifest the world that the prophet Isaiah envisioned when he wrote of a new heavens and a new earth where there is no more weeping or cries of distress, where the former things shall not be remembered or even come to mind. In times such as these, who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want to put COVID behind us and never to think about it again? Who wouldn't want the machines of war to rust away from disuse or the children to play in safety in the streets of Mariupol? Who wouldn't want to live in a world beyond poverty and racism and loneliness and cancer and competitive consumerism where the rivers run clear, biodiversity is restored and the elders tell tales of harmony, not trauma, where suffering is solved and the deep grief felt by so many of us in these days is just forgotten. It's obliterated, it's expunged, it's canceled, no more grief. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want that? I would, and I wish, I wish that is what I could proclaim from this pulpit on this day. I wish I could tell you that is how resurrection works. If we could only get it right, if only our faith was strong enough that this is the world we can live in. And I want this to be true. I wish this was true, but I know that it's not. And every time the church conflates resurrection with prosperity and sends people out into the world with this on their lips, we lose credibility. It has been almost 2,000 years since that first Easter morning and evil and suffering and death are still part of the human reality. An end to grief? That's just not how the world works. It's not how resurrection works. The truth that we must proclaim on this day is that resurrection does not wipe out suffering and grief and evil. The suffering of Jesus on the cross on Friday is not obliterated by his resurrection on Sunday. The crucifixion still happened. His death is not unmade. It is not amongst the former things that shall not be remembered or come to mind that Isaiah promises. Likewise, looking at our John reading from this morning, the resurrection does not magically erase Mary's grief. Resurrection is not an automatic reality for her. She goes to the grave on that first Easter morning, unaware that it is Easter morning. She goes, as so many of us do, when we have lost a loved one, to grieve, to mourn, to remember, 
and the absence of a body in the tomb is not a source of comfort or joy, but despair and fear. Four times we are told that she is weeping. This is no quiet, discreet shedding of tears. Mary is wailing. The Greek word used here refers to a loud and visible expression of grief, particularly as seen in, in mourning for the dead. Mary's grief is not automatically erased. And neither by the angels nor the risen Christ we see Mary's grief dismissed as foolishness or folly. Her natural reaction to the tragedy of losing her friend and teacher is noted, it's honored, and then it's responded to. Just as the resurrection does not unmake the crucifixion and the evil deeds which led to it, neither does it negate the validity of the emotions of those who were touched by it. When we gather on this day, this most important day, for those who seek to follow Christ, we do not need to put on masks and pretend that we are not something, that we are something that we're not, that the world is something that it's not. Even amongst the daffodils and the hallelujahs, hallelujahs of this day, we do not have to put on our plastic smiles and pretend that we do not suffer. We do not need to hide that this time of COVID has affected our mental and physical and spiritual health. We don't need to ignore the grief we have felt over the people we have lost or the experiences we have missed out on. We don't need to mask feelings of helplessness in the face of war and senseless death. We don't need to be ashamed of our natural responses to tragedy and stress what we are feeling in these days, whatever that may be for you is valid, and it is true. And we have come here today on this most important of days, each for our own reasons, whether out of habit or curiosity or compulsion, to see if resurrection has anything true to say to us, anything really real to say to us, even in days such as this. So let's turn to the text. It's important to note that the very first words the risen Christ utters after acknowledging Mary's grief are, who are you looking for? Who are you looking for? This mirrors closely, but not precisely, the first words of his earthly ministry captured in John chapter 1, where his disciples are, are asked, what are you looking for? He asks them, what are you looking for? Each one of us has deep hopes for our life. We all seek meaning and purpose, fulfillment and peace. We are all looking for something, searching for something important and transcendent and life-giving. And this something may be different, yet equally true for our spiritual cousins in Judaism and Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism. But the contribution of Christianity to the tapestry of human spirituality and the affirmation we proclaim on this day is that the journey of faith transforms the question, what are you looking for, to who are you looking for? From what to who, with the hinge point being the resurrection. On this most important of days, our proclamation is that what we are actually looking for is a who. The transcendent God made manifest, made incarnate, made real to us in Christ. This Jesus, the ones with hands like ours and hurts like ours, the one who knows human suffering because he has, held, he has lived human suffering, the one who understands the ways of evil because he has stared evil in the face, the one who knows our name, and calls out our name. Like Mary in the garden, we seek the one who rises with our name on his lips. This Jesus who is the Christ rises with our name on his lips, my name, your name. Just as the resurrection became real for Mary 
when Christ spoke her name. It can only become real for us when we become aware of our name also being spoken to us. I hope this is why you are here today. Or becoming aware that this is why you are here today. That what you are seeking is actually a who. The one who has journeyed alongside you in resurrection love all the days of your life. The one who forever points to an empty tomb reality where grief is not forgotten but transformed into hope by a God who does not let suffering and evil, evil and even death get the last word. This awareness of resurrection love is not something anyone else can give to you. This is beyond the limitations of our theology or doctrines or empirical data or anything I can say from this pulpit. Resurrection is transformation. To use the words of C.S. Lewis, this is deep magic. Deep magic that vanishes like mist when we try to prove or explain or even hold on too tightly. Upon hearing her name on Christ's lips, Mary rushes in to embrace him. Now that she has him back, she never wants to let him go. But again, this is not how resurrection works. Do not hold on to me, Jesus must tell her. He is not the same. He is risen. He is transformed. Like the discarded linen wrappings from the tomb, what she knew must also be discarded. She must let go of all static images of him. Christ cannot be confined to any one place or time or tradition. Resurrection defies all attempts to be captured in buildings or institutions or doctrines. He is risen with Mary's name on his lips and his instruction to her is simple. Go and tell. Go and tell what you have seen and experienced and know in your heart to be true. Go and tell the good news. And this is what she does. And in so doing, Mary becomes the first Christian preacher. The church often traces its lineage back through the centuries to Peter. But if we are true to scripture, it all starts with Mary. Mary the one who stood at the foot of the cross on Friday and sat in holy vigil on Saturday and discovered the empty tomb on Sunday, the one whom Christ met in her grief and spoke her name, who was brave enough and faithful enough to go and tell of her experience and whose ongoing witness proclaims a deeper reality, the deeper magic of a love that has no end. On this most important Sunday, there can be pressure to get Easter right and to make this service so compelling that the institution of the church prospers like the glory days of our memories. There is pressure to turn resurrection into an opioid that masks reality. But in the witness of Mary, we see something much more authentic, much more real, much more powerful we see the power to transform a life and through a life to transform other lives, to transform families and communities to be more hopeful and joyful. It is not that grief and suffering do not exist, but that we have the strength and the faith to set them down like linen wrappings in an empty tomb and declare to everyone who has ears to hear that the forces of evil and death have no claim over us. They have no power over us because we have been named. We have been claimed by a love so deep, so mysterious, that we cannot help but cry out, hallelujah, hallelujah. Perhaps what you have been searching for is actually a who. And he has risen. He has risen with your name on his lips This is good news. This is good news worth sharing. Happy Easter to you.
earth is singing, heaven is ringing, alleluia. And so we greet one another on this glorious Easter day with words and gestures of grace and peace. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. And now, as an Easter people, let us in one voice affirm our faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the Church to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. We have a number of announcements from the life and work of this community, and the first one, who was at the Good Friday evening concert. It was, I think, remarkable and a beautiful testament to what the Ministry of Music does here under the leadership of Dr. Patricia Wright. And so to Pat and to everyone involved, I offer our thanks. And while we're at it, I was leaving here last night at about 10.30 and I called back to Brian and Siva, Siva, our care staff members, and I legitimately said, we couldn't do this without you guys. And so I'd like to just lift up the names of the staff of Metropolitan Church who have been working so hard on your behalf to pull off uh, Lent and Holy Week and, and work so hard throughout the year. So. Our property staff are Frank and Poovy, Siva and Brian. Our technicians, the boys in the booth, Nish and Paya and Charlie sometimes who wears many, many hats around here. Our admin staff, Jane and Sheila, Elena, Kay. Our community service workers are Megan, Stephanie and Leah. Music, of course, Patricia, Joshua, the choir leads and I think, I hope that's, I hope that's it. <laughs> and uh, of course, Reverend Mark will be back uh, this coming week. I'll be crawling up in a ball after the service, so if you need anything, contact him. Um, so please, let us uh, show our appreciation to the staff of Metropolitan Church. <laughs> a couple more things. I'm pleased to let you know that we are launching a new full-time program at Metropolitan. We've been doing it over this time of Lent and it's Centering Prayer on Monday evenings on Zoom at 8 p.m. If you're looking to invest in your spiritual well-being, this is a, a very simple time of silent meditation led by one of our members and it is just a, a beautiful uh, time to gather together. I'll also let you know that we're looking for a couple actually a few volunteers for key positions. Uh, we need more ushers. We're looking for up to four ushers to help on Sunday morning. And if you're new to the church and are looking to get to know people, this is a really great way to, um, to be introduced to folks as they come in. And also for folks watching online or maybe for many of you who maybe this is uh, uh, online is how you now worship with, with Met, 
we're also looking for a digital worship host to welcome people uh, on the, the chats for our live stream. So if you can step into one of those volunteer roles, please get in touch with me. I'll also just mention quickly as we transition into our time of offering that we offer our, our gratitude to everyone in the community who offered a uh, Easter offering and a memorial gift to the church. And those who offered a memorial gift to somebody that they've lost and are thinking about, those names are in your bulletins and will come up on the screen at the end of the service, I believe. So we come now to our time of offering. This is our third Easter of the COVID era, and the gifts we receive this day are very important to support the ministry and mission of Metropolitan. For those here at the church, there are offering plates at the back. For those worshiping online, please visit metunited.ca slash donate to see all the different ways to give. The gifts that we bring to this community partner with Resurrection Power, helping, helping us to awaken wholeness in the broken, strength in the weakened, and liberation for all living in the midst of injustice. Let us share our generosity with each other and the community. Let us now consider our offering.
Let us pray. You, O God, are the Easter One. You are the source of resurrection, of transformation, and new life. We offer our gifts in gratitude for hope returned, for the mystery of your grace, and for the promise of resurrection. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us, let us give thanks to the Lord God. Let us pray. As we come to the table, we are reminded that this is not the table of Metropolitan United Church, nor is it the table of the United Church of Canada or any particular denomination. It is the table of Jesus Christ, the family feast of the whole people of God, all who seek to be nourished and sustained on the journey of faith and long to live justly and in peace with their neighbor are welcome here. Let us feast together for our strengthening in faith for the sake of the world. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of light, giver of all life, source of love. With your breath, you formed all that we are and all that is beyond us, and the heavens tell your glory. Through fear-filled days and aching nights, when the powers of death have done their worst, your love has never deserted us. Even when we turn away from you, you are with us. Your presence never fails us and your gifts of hope and new life transform us. We praise you for your child, Jesus, risen to life, eternal as your love. With Mary at the tomb, we proclaim, Alleluia, life is stronger than death. The day of resurrection has come, scattering fear and gloom. And so we rejoice with all your people of every time and place, and with the angels and archangels to proclaim the glory of your name. Let us remember together that vision of God's reign shown to us in Jesus at the table. When he shared food with followers and friends, with saints and sinners, with crowds of thousands on the hillside, and a few disciples in an upper room. On the night before he died, he had supper with his companions, and he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, Come and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he passed it among them and said, Drink this. Do this in remembrance of me. Through this loaf and cup, Jesus lives within us. In word and deed, Jesus lives among us. Eternal God, we unite in this covenant of faith as we break bread and share the cup, giving thanks for your love in Jesus the Christ. 
we spread your table with these gifts of the earth and of our labor. We present to you our very lives, committed to your service on behalf of all people, proclaiming the mystery of faith. On Good Friday, he died. On Easter, he rose again. Today, he lives forever. We pray you, God of love, send your Holy Spirit upon us and what we do here, that we and these gifts touched by your Spirit might be signs of life and love to each other and to all the world. At this time, we also remember all those with whom you would have us share your feast. We pray for all who are in sorrow or are in pain, all who are ill or alone, all who live with fear, oppression, or hunger, all those impacted by war and shameful violence, all whom the world counts as last and least. We pray for our church and its many ministries, for the nations as they strive for peace and justice, for the earth and the fragile web of life we share with our creatures around us. We pray for our families and friends and all those we now pray your blessing upon in the silence of our hearts. We praise you, eternal God, through Christ, your word made flesh, and in the power of your life-giving spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All is prepared. We will serve the choir first, and then Warren and I will, Warren and I will go down and serve first the band, and then the congregation, the ushers, will help guide you when your time to come out of your row is at hand. If you'd like to take communion, you in the balcony, please come down. If you uh, would prefer to remain in your seat, please do so, and uh, Dr. Holness will come around with communion. My friends, these are the gifts of God for a people of God. Please come to the table.
body of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. The body of Jesus broken for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. The body of Christ, Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Christ, the bread of life. The body of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. The body of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Body of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Body of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Kayla, the body of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. The body of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. The body of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. The body of Christ. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. The body of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. The body of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. The body of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. The body of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Jesus Christ, the bread of life. The body of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the body of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life.
blood of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the bread of life, the body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. <laughs> Jesus Christ, the bread of life, the, uh, the body of Christ broken for you. Jesus Christ, the true vine. We offer now this prayer written by Metropolitan Silver Band member, Olivia Smith. Please let us pray. Brother Christ, resurrected Christ, in defiance of destructive forces, we attempt to live life abundantly, laughing, celebrating, loving, crying and sharing, nurturing hope and feeding love being your people and embodying your story of new life. May we be empowered by the mystery of our faith and strengthened through our love of you to avoid the temptation to settle for lesser evils, but to fight always for the way of love. For as long as you live, love lives. And wherever you are, there too will be love. And we say hallelujah as we pray now the prayer that Jesus taught so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
from this Easter festival go out to live resurrection, that we and all creation might be one with the living Christ. Go now, but please know that God knows you and loves you. The risen Christ journeys beside you as savior and as friend, and that the Holy Spirit absolutely surrounds and fills you now and forever. Amen.